Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together we are decoding the deception. Together we are studying the gospel of John. I, I pray that this study is being an ongoing blessing for you. It certainly is for me as I get to teach it. There is something warm and endearing about the Gospel of John, how he wrote, how his his perspective on things, which the Holy Spirit used because he wanted us to have that perspective on things. Last time, we covered John 3.16, the Gospel in a nutshell. It's all there, and we looked at how the passages that precede it, that with references to Daniel and, and Numbers, with those events played into that, putting all the more clarity for us to see that great statement that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his one of a kind, his born in a unique way, very special son, because that's about what you need to think of when you see the word here only, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we talked last time, but I cannot help but state again the very clear universality of the gospel for all, for whoever believes, for the world. It is very clear that God doesn't want anyone to perish. God desires that no one perish. It's it's not what he wants but have eternal life, and he wants that for everyone. And and what we see as we move forward today is going to make that very clear. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, we're we're going to complete this third chapter today, and as we do that, we'll look at some things, interaction with John the Baptist, which is what the, the chapter concludes talking about. But there is an overarching concept that we need to look at as the thread that weaves through all this text. There is a condition, a reality of wrath, God's wrath, the just and holy God, wrath from him under which, without Jesus Christ, men exist. We are sheltered from that wrath We are saved, spared from that wrath through Jesus Christ. But that reality, and it's something that is not focused on, sin isn't talked about all that much. Sin has been defined down. It's been watered down to where most of us don't even have a firm grasp. Most of the world does not have a grasp at all on what sin is. Sin deserves damnation. God's judgment of sin is not unjust. We are blessed that what we're told in John 3.16, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that serpent lifted up on the pole that when the children of Israel who had rebelled, who deserved God's wrath, who were being bitten by venomous snakes and dying, they deserved that. They rebelled against God. They stepped outside of his grace, and it is not a place that you want to be, and it is not the place God wants you to be. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. He did not come to condemn. It wasn't his purpose. It wasn't his purpose. His purpose was love. His purpose was grace. His purpose was salvation in order that the world might be saved through him. God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so, verse 18 continues on, whoever believes in him is not condemned. We deserve to be condemned, but we're not condemned. Why? Because God, through his son, Jesus Christ, he took our sin, he put it on him. Christ went to the cross and paid the price for our sin. Your sin earned and merited the wrath of God, and it got it. It's just that Jesus took it for you. He stepped in for you. So whoever believes in him is not condemned. He was condemned for you. But whoever does not believe, whoever rejects him, is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only very special begotten in a unique way, Son of God. Now, I have said before that in this section here in John 3, we have all of these parallels with what we are told in John 1 in the prologue. Okay? So I, in order that I'm not in the way, am going to make myself disappear so that we can look at these parallels. Because here on the right, I've got John 1. You see it up here. John 1. Over here on the left, we're in John 3.16. So we're going to see that the, the truths, the, the themes that John was going to weave throughout the gospel that he was writing, this letter to talk about, to tell with everyone a historical record of who Jesus was and what he did, those themes that he sets forth in the first chapter in the introduction come very much, they come through clearly here in this section. Okay, verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light, the light. Notice it's the. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And you look over here in John 1, and if you, were, you saw that first video we did, videos, because it took us a few to get through the prologue, you see light, 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 light. Verse 9 reads, The true light... Here's the true light. Here it's the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Verse 11 of chapter 1, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And his own, it's like his own stuff, right? He came to what was his. What, what, what was, you know, it's like going home is the, the way this term is, is to be understood. And those who were his own, his kin, his family, did not receive him. Why? Because their works were evil, and so they don't want to come into the light. And the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. And John always uses these very clear, understandable terms to express these truths that are so profound. And make no mistake about it, if you have tried to teach, if you have tried to communicate the profound, in as simple a way as possible, you cannot but stand in awe of the way Jesus and John in his gospel sets these things forth. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his work should be 
exposed. When you were a kid and you were doing really mean, nasty things, you didn't do it in front of the teacher. If you, when, when kids are picking on another kid out on the playground, you didn't do it right in front of the teacher. Why? Because that was in the light. The teacher would see it. You didn't do things that were bad, that were sinful, that were misbehaving in front of your mom and dad. Why? Because it would be seen and dealt with. That's the concept that is here, but at a much deeper and significant level. But whoever does what is true, and who does what is true? Those who are, who did receive him. Verse 12 in chapter 1, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. Back to verse 21 in chapter 3, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And what do we have over here? It's talking about being born, not of blood, nor of the will of God, but of God. So these themes coming through again and again, and that is, no matter how you slice it, that is masterful teaching. Okay. Now let's get back to John the Baptist. Big picture. John the Baptist, I think, is one of the great examples of faith and faithfulness and certainly of service in all the scriptures. John was a very special guy. He was very special because he didn't care what anyone thought about him. And that is difficult. There are many people who say they don't care what other people think about them. Mm, That's usually not entirely true. John really and truly didn't care. It's not that, rather than saying that what it's not, it was only because the only thing that mattered to John was his service to the Lord. And a servant a servant, one who kneels and bows down and does for the master, a good servant, a loving servant, is not concerned about themselves. They are concerned about those they serve. Think of your mother. Those who are blessed to have a good mother, and I know that's not everyone, and I'm sorry, for that, I am. I was blessed to have a wonderful mother. My wife is a wonderful mother. Mothers are the most selfless people. It's always about the kids. They're always taking care of the kids. They are, they are spent for the sake of their kids. It starts with going through burying a child and giving birth to a child. But that Concern for others before oneself is, as it is in a mother, beautifully exemplified, fully exemplified, out there for all to see with John the Baptist. And and I will say that along with Joseph and Daniel, I believe that John the Baptist is one of those major characters in Scripture, and by characters I just mean people in the Scriptures, about whom nothing negative is said. Now later John comes, he sends his disciples. When he's in prison, a rat-infested hole, chained to a wall, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one, or should we look for another? And with that I see no lack of faith. Jesus praises him immediately thereafter and says, Among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Okay. John did that because John 
John was something wonderful. He was a fanatic. And he wasn't a fanatic for some sport or a race car. John, or a race camel, whatever. John was a fanatic for his savior, for the mission he had been given. And there in that dank, dark place, he wanted to know if he had done his job or not. Is my course run or is it not? And if it wasn't, he was going to figure out how to go about doing what he needed to do. I don't think that we can characterize that as a character flaw or shortcoming or failing. So, to the text. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anan near Salem, which, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Just geographically, John was always out in the wilderness and baptizing. Jesus and his disciples went out into the countryside. Jesus didn't seek the limelight. Jesus wanted to be able to teach. He wanted to be able to teach his disciples. Okay. And John was there and people were coming and being baptized. That's that was still going on. This was before John had been put into prison. Now a discussion arose between oh, I've got to say one thing. John was also baptizing in Anon near Salem because water was plentiful there. How you're baptized doesn't matter. Whether you go under or whether you get sprinkled or poured on your head with a cup, the word baptizo literally means to apply with water, to apply water, apply water. It's all it means. And at most times throughout the year, the River Jordan was so shallow, you couldn't dunk someone down into it. So I don't think John was hung up. On that, we in the church today and churches and denominations get hung up on things that that do not matter. You cannot biblically say that you have to be immersed to be baptized. Bible doesn't say it. The Word doesn't say it. And if you were supposed to be, I think the Holy Spirit would have made that clear. It's perfectly fine to be immersed. Just don't think that that's the only baptism. That matters. The Bible doesn't say it. Enough on that. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, and they came to John and said to him, Now, now how it goes, and, and I don't know from purification and exactly what they're talking about with purification, if that's tied directly to baptism or not, but They end up talking about Jesus, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi. Rabbi was just that term for my teacher. He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. We'll stop there and talk about that. So they turned to Jesus. Jesus was there, and it says in one of the other Gospels, Jesus wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were. It it makes that clear. Jesus didn't come to, to baptize. But his disciples are are having the reaction that anyone would have. Our movement here, and yes, it was all about the Messiah and all that, our movement here is fizzling out. It's... It's going away. They feel like I spoke to a a missionary one time, heard him speaking, and and he talked about when he was in Africa, or might have been in in New Guinea. I think it was New Guinea. And he had a guide. 
who translated for him and helped him. And then he got to where he was able to speak to the natives himself. And the guide looked at him and said, what do you do with the dirt once the hole is dug? And he said it took him a while to figure out what he was asking. You've learned the language now. I'm of no use to you. Which wasn't true because he still needed a guide to help him and all, all kinds of things. But that's what was going on. That's what was going on. They were all going to Jesus. And, and John, who had... Huge crowds at one time. I've talked about that. He was like the equivalent of a rock star. Everyone was going to him, and now everyone was going to Jesus. And his disciples felt like, hey, wow, this is not a good thing. They had feelings about that. But John answered, and this, if these truths that John sets forth here, if we can take them and apply them to ourselves, and we can, but if we do so regularly, we will do very well. Because we all look around. Now, he's going to be talking about his position in relation to Jesus. But we do the same thing looking at ourselves in relation to others, others who are more gifted than we are, more intelligent, better looking, wealthier, whatever. John said this, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you're able to do, everything that you have accomplished, all that you are is a gift. That's what John is saying big picture. That's what John is saying. He's just taking it and applying it to himself more specifically. And and Paul says to the Corinthians, what do you have? Because they were so gifted and blessed. And of all his congregations, they were the ones that were like, wow, those people got skills. And Paul said to them, what do you have that you did not receive? If you are talented at whatever it is, be thankful. Be thankful. If you're smart and can do different things, be thankful. If you're able to communicate well, if you're able to to put people at ease and be helpful to other people, be thankful. Those things are gifts. They come from God. John goes on, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. That's my role. Know your place. And it's hard to know your place, but I can I can know my place by simply trying to be faithful, trying to do the things I know I can do, praying God's blessing, praying him to guide me in what I ought to be doing and be thankful with that. We are not judged by success. I'm not judged by the number of views my videos get. I'm not. I'm judged by faithfulness. Am I using my skills and abilities given by God to do the best in teaching his word to other people? Know who you are. Be at peace with it. Be at peace with it. God only wants faithfulness. I am not the Christ. I'm not the big guy. I'm the mouthpiece going before him, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. And then he uses the picture of being the best man. Best man might be a single guy, right? And he sees his buddy and he's got this beautiful girl who they're going to be married. And a good friend says, wow, I'm really happy for him. That's awesome. What I, I, but, but she's his, she's not mine. I'm just the bridegroom. I'm just the, the friend of the bride. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He sees Jesus with his bride, the church, and he knows his job is done. Now, later he's going to have doubts in prison. 
he's just going to want to make sure that he sees things as they are and he understands his place. Here's a big one. Here's a big one. It's not about me. Not about me. I'll just talk about myself directly. I get out here. I get on the on the internet and I and I teach these videos and I got my website and and none of it is about me. None of it. And, and John models that perfectly and says he must increase, but I must decrease. He did what he was supposed to do, and it wasn't about John. John is no one's savior. Jesus is. And he continues on. And, and, and it's debatable, and, and theologians, you know, everybody needs things to discuss and, and argue over whether what continues on here is John just picking it up and going, or if it's still John the Baptist, remember two different Johns, John the Baptist speaking. And it could be either one. See these things right here. See it right here. That quotation mark. There is no quotation mark in Greek. In, in Koine Greek, classical Greek, there are no quotation marks. There is no punctuation. There was none of that. So the, an editor put that here. So whether this is John moved by the Holy Spirit or John the Baptist speaking by the Holy Spirit and John recording it, it doesn't matter which it is. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. This picture of that which is superior, that which is divine, the one who has come down to earth in a special way is being fleshed out here. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. And yet no one receives his testimony. We're back over to John 1, 10 and 11. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. He's directly from heaven. <clears throat> Pardon me. He is directly from heaven. He is the son of of man come down to earth, and yet no one receives him. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this that God is true. What exactly does that mean, that part about God being true? Okay, and there's a lot we could talk about here with the sets his seal to this. It's like putting your stamp of approval on the fact that God is true. God said he was going to send a Savior, and he sent a Savior, and here he is. God did what God said he was going to do. And then Jesus, looking on into the future, said he was going to die and rise again. And lo and behold, he did. God is true. God is true. Let God be true, and every man a liar. It is the only thing that you can trust, the word of God, the promises of your Savior, and not one of them ever falls to the ground. He keeps them all. God is true. And when and when we see the evil of this world advancing and growing like a wave coming toward us, and we feel the waters starting to rise, we hold fast to God's promises that he will take care of us, that we are his and that nothing can take us out of his hand. For he whom God sent utters the words of God, where he gives the spirit without measure. He just pours it out. He just pours it out. And I often think what it must have been like to hear Jesus teaching, reading the word is powerful and amazing, but the authority that had to be there when he spoke, which many people attested to, he teaches with authority and not as the scribes, it was said. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Back to that comfort. 
He's given all things into his hand. We're told in Ephesians 1 that Christ rules all things. Now the ascended Christ, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, rules all things for the sake of his church, those who did receive him, those who came into the light and rejoiced in the light. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You believe? You have eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. And and obedience and faith, the Scripture uses them. They use them interchangeably quite often. To obey means to put yourself under. Under. It's it's listening to that which is above and putting yourself under is the is the word picture that is painted by that word obey again again he came into the world to save the world not to condemn the world but if someone comes and offers you an umbrella and you choose to stand in the rain you're going to get wet and stay wet. If someone gives you forgiveness and you push your hand out and and push it away and you don't want it, then you're not going to see life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus wants to take the wrath away. He did take the wrath of w- away. He took the wrath that you deserve and I deserve, and he took that away, and he took it away for everyone else. And our glorious task is to share with others that truth that in Christ there is redemption, that he paid the price, and he warmly welcomes all who through faith come to him. We are going to stop there, and we will pick up next time with John 4, and Jesus is going to meet that Samaritan woman at a well, and there are a lot of interesting things to talk about there. So before I go, want to encourage you to come out here. This is the business that we have set up to resolve a couple different issues. Number one, need to support this ministry. And so we are operating this company behind the scenes video. I do professional video editing. That probably doesn't apply to most of you, but what's right over here on the screen on the, this side over here by the puppy dog sticking his nose through the curtain, a stack of photos. You've got photos sitting around. They've been left behind in the digital age. They're in albums, they're in boxes. We have a service where we will scan those photos for you for 25 cents a piece. Only 25 cents a piece. The competition charges 60 cents, and our service that we provide, the level of scanning, is higher than theirs. We will scan those photos for you, digitalize them, and send them back to you and ship your originals back to you. We also have the ability to enhance Those photos do color correction, get rid of red eye. That's just 50 cents a photo. You you can look here on the webpage. We can enhance those photos through artificial intelligence. And let me tell you, it's really cool. We also do that for digital photos. You've got photos you want to enhance and take the next level. Come out here. I'll put the link down below. It's behind the scenes dot video and click on photos and it'll take you right here. It's a way you can support this ministry, but it's a way we can do something for you and take those memories, preserve them, share them for generations to come. So come out here, check this out. And because you're a listener to decoding the deception, use the code, the coupon code decoding 20. Decoding 20, I'm putting it on the screen, and you get 20% off your order. So go check it out. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.